All right, good morning everybody and thank you for joining Lulu's Get Smart With Your Cover Art webinar. Um, my name is Graham Williams. I'm the email marketing manager here at Lulu. Um, we will be getting started momentarily, but before we begin, I just wanted to briefly go over some basics to remember throughout the webinar. Uh, so during the presentation, if you have any questions you'd like to submit uh, to our speakers, you can do so by using the questions button on the webinar menu. Uh, likewise, you'll see a chat button as well, which you can use if you simply just want to add a comment. Um, as a follow-up to our presentation, we will be answering as many submitted questions as we can. Uh, additionally, if we don't get around to answering your uh, specific question, have no fear. Uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a recording of the webinar, uh, as well as any answers to all questions submitted during the presentation. <clears throat> so for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, Lulu is a self-publishing and print-on-demand company based here in Raleigh. Um, Raleigh, North Carolina. So although our website has a large online presence, we're actually a rather small company. We're small but mighty. We have uh, a little bit less than 100 employees working at our Raleigh office. Um, so I just wanted to include the, uh, the mission statement here because I think it does a great job of just summing up what we do uh, and what our main goal is here at Lulu. So we are dedicated to making the world a better place, one book at a time, through sustainable practices, uh, innovative on-demand products, and a commitment to excellent uh, service. Um, so as I mentioned, the team here at Lulu is all about sustainable practices and community outreach. So at Lulu, we're really proud of the fact that we are the only B Corp in the print-on-demand publishing industry, uh, meaning that we're constantly looking at all aspects of our business and really just continuously thinking about how we can adjust our business model to uh, decrease our carbon footprint as a company. Um, additionally, we're very involved with our local community as well here in Raleigh. So if you're ever, you know, by chance driving through the area, there's a good chance you'll uh, catch some of our employees working with Habitat for Humanity or really just volunteering at our local Wolfpack uh, at NC State. <laughs> but enough about us. Uh, <clears throat> we're here today to talk about uh, creating amazing book covers. So thank you again for joining us today. And without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Chelsea to get things started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, so before we get started, I do just want to give a special shout out to anyone who is returning um, with us or who is back for our webinar round two um, and who decided to come back even though we had some technical difficulties um, with round one. So luckily, we now know what not to do. So huge props to everyone who decided to come back. So and welcome all of you who maybe are new to us. And if you are new, then we didn't have any issues and we're perfect every time. So um, today we are going to be talking about uh, book covers. So, um, you know, get smart with your cover art is why we are here. So to get started, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the art of selling a book. So um, just some components that can make, uh, you can use and some tips and tricks to help you sell books. Books. I don't know. That was weird. Um, OK, so what makes books sell? So here are just some things that you're going to want to consider as you are putting your book together and thinking of a launch. So obviously the content and, and the timing are really critical. And this is really a unique, um, I think, value add that self-publishing brings to the table because you know, if you have something that is really relevant to the times that we're living in um, or anything that's going on, current events, then self-publishing is a great route to go because you can publish that content immediately while it's still fresh and while those ideas are still top of mind. Um, traditional publishers can often take 18 to 24 months to get your content out. So um, sometimes, you know, these, these things that are really timely may uh, not be as effective when you release it, you know, a year or two years later. Um, so those are always things that you want to be considerate of when you are planning that book launch. What's the best time that you can release this book? And are there any relevant tie-ins that you can account for there? Um, audience, obviously. Um, and this is another thing that can be really great for self-publishing because, you know, when we talk about audience and building your author brand, um, some people can get kind of caught up in the numbers and really want to have a huge following and that's great and you can get there absolutely but don't uh, knock your your like I'll, I'll still Graham's term small but mighty following um, so you know we like to talk about true fans here and um, you know if you have a small group or a niche group that is perfect for self-publishing because you can reach those folks and not incur a lot of overhead and you know a lot of um, large publishers kind of shy away from really niche content because it's not going to move a lot of quantity um, but as an independent uh, as an independently published author or as a self-published author you can kind of um, navigate that a little bit better and reach exactly who your content is for 
Um, price point, of course. So you obviously want to be considerate of where you're pricing your book. Um, and we'll talk about this with covers as well, but for your price point, you want to look in your genre and at other books that are similar, um, with similar content, similar links, similar format, so you can get a good idea of the range and where you want to fall within that. Um, so best practice is sort of, you want to kind of be in the middle of what you're seeing. Um, you know, you don't want to be too high because, you know, that can scare some readers off. You don't want to be too low because then they're thinking this content isn't really worth anything um, or you may get some eyebrows raised there so you kind of want to be in that sweet spot um, thoughtful design so of course we'll be getting into this today with your cover designing but um, you know you really want to be intentional about the things you're putting on the cover um, because obviously you know as <laughs> as the saying goes um, we do you know judge books by their cover um, so we'll get we're gonna get into that today and how to make sure uh, you have a good judgment. Um, and then back cover blurb. Um, so this is also really important. So the cover is pulling your readers in, um, but we've all been there in the bookstore where you see the cover and you think, okay, great, you know, I'm intrigued. And you flip it over to get more information. And then that's kind of, you know, you have one foot in the door and you need that back cover blurb to really sell it and um, send your message home and get that reader to, uh, to make the purchase. All right. So the anatomy of a good book cover. So um, this is a beautiful book that we've got um, that uh, one of our authors created on the Lulu platform. Um, and so we're just going to kind of walk through some of these elements um, that can really come together to make a really well done book cover. Um, so you see this is obviously a beautiful cover, um, really, really nice colors that she's got going on. Um, you can easily see the title. Um, then she's got a little subtitle right there and the author name. So it's a really prominent. You're not searching all over for them. You see this captivating image. And then you can see how the colors and um, kind of the, the feel of the cover really kind of flows into the, the type that she used in the font. Um, and you can see that the image continues onto the back cover, which is really nice as well. Um, so she has this captivating image and artwork. Um, and then when you flip it over on the back, you have this endorsement, <clears throat> which is fantastic. So um, this book is nonfiction, but for fiction or nonfiction, if you have um, advanced reviews or if you've gotten some good feedback on the book, then quote it, put it right there. Because you know there's nothing that can be more convincing to a reader than someone else saying, hey, this book is great. I read it. You should read it too. Um, and kind of highlighting what they got from it. So any good endorsements or reviews, um, you know, we see some authors putting that on their front cover. Um, this has a really clean aesthetic, so you see that it's on the back. Um, either works. I mean, it really just depends on the flow of your cover. Um, and, you know, the length of the review can also come into play. Um, so she also has a uh, photo there um, and her author bio. Um, and that's maybe where the blurb would go as well. So for photos and author bios, um, you can kind of take it or leave it. Again, that's really going to be dictated by you and sort of the community you're trying to reach and the vibe of your book. Um, so maybe if you're writing a romance novel or a thriller or a murder mystery, you really just want the reader to be um, captivated by the book and the story immediately. And so you don't want them thinking about, you know, you as an author or, you know, really interest, uh, you know, reading your bio up front. Um, there's obviously room for that, and you can put it on your author website or author blog or however you want to accommodate that. Um, but these are just some elements, some best practices of things you're going to want to include on the cover. Um, and, you know, this is all dictated by you and the audience you're reaching and the message you're trying to send with your cover. Okay, so smart cover art. Here are some real world examples of some really nice covers. Um, so this is kind of a mix of fiction and nonfiction. Um, so the Ethiopian coffee varieties, this is a great book. If you're familiar, um, if you're a, a coffee connoisseur, uh, you may be familiar with Counterculture. Um, so they published this book with us, it's beautifully done. The interior looks fantastic as well, but a really cool aesthetic um, and it looks really nice. You know, again, clean. You can see their little logo at the top. You can immediately see the title and the author name at the bottom. So really well done. Um, this next one, How Not to Save the World, is a fiction uh, title. It's in a series. Um, and what's really nice and something to consider uh, if you are doing a book that's in a series is continuing that aesthetic throughout the whole series. Um, so Jessica Thomas, who is the author of this book, has released her second, uh, the second novel in this series, and she continued this very similar aesthetic. So that's something to think about as you begin to build your author brand, that you want to have a, um, you know, you want to have a font or a style that really represents you and that your readers can recognize. So she, did a, she does a great job with this, and continuing that just kind of helps to build her brand, reinforce that, and give her readers kind of something to anchor to as they're looking for her work. Next up is Stories from the Street. This is a, a, another really fun book. 
Um, so this uh, this book is about busking, as you may be able to tell from the busker on the cover there. Um, so I love what she did here. Uh, the author, you know, made the book look like it was a wrinkled envelope. So you can kind of get that vibe of someone who's traveling the country and having all these experiences. Um, you know, you see the stamps on there. The, the title is obviously very prominent, easy to read. Um, so I love this one. This is a really nice example. And she's doing things a little bit differently because the author name is not um, is not featured on the front. So you can play around with these elements and again, just find what works for you and what, what makes the most sense for your author brand. Um, moving along, uh, one of my favorite Lulu books, these are all, all Lulu books are my favorite Lulu books, but I really love this one. Um, this is the coffee table book of rejected coffee table books. Um, so this gentleman uh, <laughs> pitched multiple coffee table books and, um, you know, fortunately for Lulu, maybe unfortunately for him at the time, they were all rejected by other publishers and he decided to make a book out of that. So I love that his good humor about it um, and I think a win for Lulu to have this book in our catalog. Um, some of the notable uh, rejected ideas were voodoos and voodons, um, also alternative uses for alternative medicines. So um, these are all available in the Lulu bookstore if you are, if, you, if your interest is piqued by that. Um, but this is a great one. Again, you know, you have the coffee mug on the book um, and then, you know, the, the title again, really prominent, highlights rejected so your eye is immediately drawn to it. Author name at the bottom, pretty, pretty textbook cover there. Um, so the next one is pretty. Um, so this is another great one. A uh, really captivating image on the front, and this book is for um, really body positivity. And so you can see immediately that that's relayed, um, and you can kind of get that feel that it might be gritty, and that there may be some stories in there that are, um, you know, that might have a little bit darker tones to them, um, but overall going to be an uplifting uh, journey for the reader. So I like that one a lot too. Um, and then last but not least is um, Omar Epps. He published his memoir with us last year. And so this is a really great one. Um, this is obviously a, a nonfiction title. Um, the author name prominent, the title is prominent, and you can tell immediately this is going to be an intimate journey that you're going to take with uh, with Mr. Epps. So I mean, obviously from fatherless to fatherhood, you can kind of tell what the book will have, um, some of the content. But the cover does a really good job of sort of relaying um, the seriousness and sort of the intimacy that the book will um, will show. Okay, so cover art trends for 2019. What is coming? What's new and what's next? So bold typography. We had some examples of this in the previous slide, but uh, this is something that we see all the time. And, you know, I think it's probably on cover art trends every single year because you really can't go wrong with having a bold, um, a, a bold title that really stands out to the reader. So that's a good one. Very classic go to um, this. Uh, the next one that I'll speak on is a little bit newer uh, images obscuring text. So you can see in our little tiny example here that uh, you, the image is uh, kind of going over the text. It's really beautifully done. Um, you can look at, uh, you know, and this is kind of goes for any of these. You can look at the bestsellers list or any bookstore, any local bookstore that has, um, you know, some new titles out, and you're going to see a lot of these designs coming into play. Um, but images obscuring text is sort of something that has traditionally been a no-no kind of in the uh, cover art world um, because obviously when you're obscuring text, it makes it a little bit harder to read. So you do have to, it kind of goes back to that intentional design. You have to have that intentionality behind it, but it can be really well done and really make a beautiful cover that really kind of goes into the art realm um, and kind of steps out of just the, the kind of book cover scope. Um, hyper real design. So what we're uh, referencing here is when you see books that have um, actual photographs on the on the cover or, you know, maybe headlines or newspapers that are used in the design. So we've seen a lot of that and that can be um, a really interesting element, especially if it's a, a true, um, a true account, true crime. That's kind of where we're seeing that and it, it can be really well done. Up next is Lydian Font. I'm a fan of this one. Um, again, you can look at any titles or there are several titles right now that are coming out that are utilizing this. So you won't have to look far to see this in action or in the wild. Um, but that's another great one that we're seeing. Um, hand lettering. So you, you, we see hand lettering a lot. I mean, if you go to events or even on different author websites, a lot of people are utilizing this hand lettering look. Um, it's a really nice aesthetic, kind of gives you, you know, obviously the look of hand lettered. <laughs> so it can be a really nice addition to add to your Cover, depending on the content. Um, color wise, um, Paul is going to talk about kind of color palettes a little bit later, um, but up front, orange, yellow, and pink are the colors that we're seeing a lot of uh, this year. 
and you know this is a, a nice trend that's going on those are obviously lovely colors but you know if you're writing a murder novel then you're probably not going to want maybe you do actually you do you but yeah so i mean these are some of the things that we're seeing but of course it all goes back to your book your audience and the content that you are creating so you know we're going to give you some tips and tricks here but don't feel like you have to utilize all or any of these all right and i think uh, paul's up next all right thanks chelsea so now we're going to move on to uh, talking about designing the cover. Now that we've got some great ideas to kind of get you started thinking about what your cover might look like, we're going to dig in a little bit to uh, the literal, actual building of this cover file, the, uh, the piece of art. And this can be a little bit trickier because it's going to take some technical know-how and some best practices, but uh, we're going to see if we can kind of pull some of what Chelsea was talking about together and use it to, to help you figure out how to make your cover. Okay, so the first uh, technical thing that we need to talk about is full bleed. Um, I'm going to guess, since you're all here, um, you have some experience in the self-publishing world, and you know you've heard the term full bleed a few times. Um, so I'm going to just cover it real quick with this cover example, which I don't know if you're seeing this cover. is awesome. I love this dinosaur anatomy book. But um, if you look closely, you'll see around the outer edge a very small white dashed line that I'm pointing at my screen here and you guys can't see that, but um, that has scissors kind of tracing around it. That line is showing you where the printers will cut the book paper and the book cover to finalize it. So when they print it, they print it oversized and then they trim it down to finalize it. For any piece of uh, content from the cover to the interior that has art or ink that goes all the way to the edge of the page, it has to extend past the actual edge so that when we trim it, there isn't any white bordering. And for a cover, this is really, really important because the last thing you want is to have a cover that shows, you know, a little white edge around the outer, outer edges of it. So what we do is we say to add um, an eighth of an inch, that's 0 0.125 inches on all sides so that we have a margin we can trim off um, when we're cleaning up and finalizing that cover. That's really important to be aware of. You'll want to prepare all of your files for your cover with full bleed. Um, and, you know, take note, whatever publishing company you might use to, you know, to get your book made, we, we hope you use Lulu because we're the best. But, you know, <laughs> whoever you use, when they provide you a template, it should include full bleed. Check for it, but it should be there. Um, and then last thing I'm going to show you on this cover here is if you look in the center of it, you'll see a purple area marked out with more dashed lines called the spine. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about next. So the one prime variable with designing your cover that you can't control is the spine width. You know, we can provide you a template for the front and back that's going to fit based on the size of your book. If you're making a six by nine book, we know that your front cover and your back cover are going to be a certain size. And we can provide you a file that you can template for that. But we have no idea what the spine is going to be because the page count will vary. So, you know, if you've got 100 pages, 200 pages, 413 pages, that's going to change the width of your spine. Um, luckily, some book creation wizards out there got their calculators out and figured out this calculation for paperback books. If you take your page count and you divide that by 444 and then you add 0 0.06 you will get your spine width in inches. I have no idea why that works or how that works or whatever. Um, but in my experience, it is fairly universal that that will get you a spine width. Um, and we've tested this with a few different self-publishing companies out there that let you, you know, upload your own covers. And it seems to work pretty universally. Um, the one thing I will say is that, again, if you're using Lulu and you get to the point where you're ready to upload your cover, we're gonna provide you specs and a template most um, print on demand companies are going to do this. So always verify that number. Um, you know, you'll be able to see exactly what we expect. It, it, it could be like up to a hundredth of an inch off and you're probably okay. But if you're getting into the tenths of an inch off from your math versus what we provide you, that might be the time to, you know, get in touch with somebody or just double, get back and double check and make sure everything is right. All right. Last piece of the technical puzzle is image quality. So, We've got on the screen here um, an image at 300 DPI and at 72 DPI. Um, so what's DPI? I put it right on the screen for you. Uh, it's dots per inch. Um, you might also hear that referred to as pixels per inch. And what it's referring to is the, the density of the image. Um, it's sort of hard to tell on a screen, but the image on the left is much clearer and crisper than the image on the right. Um, 72 DPI is generally considered to be good for a screen. 
So, you know, they, they both kind of will look good on, the, on your um, computer screen here. But if you were to go print these, the 72 DPI image would actually be sort of pixelated. Um, it, would, it would be a little grainy. So you want to just make sure that when you're creating your cover, first off, any images that you add or that you create, you do so at 300 DPI. <clears throat> um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me. And then most importantly, once you've got your file done, you know, you've finished creating your cover and you're ready to export it to a PDF so you can, you know, make your book with it, make sure that the export also retains that 300 DPI resolution. Um, this is really important because there's a lot of software, particularly Microsoft Word is notorious for uh, compressing, for smooshing down your file. I don't know if that's a technical term, but, um, and losing some of that image quality. So you wanna make sure that when you export it, you're exporting it at the quality you created it at. Um, most other software like Photoshop, InDesign, Canva even, um, and I'll go into a few different programs that are good for creating cover images in a, in a moment, but almost everything else is going to give you a very clear option when you go to export it to say, you know, what resolution do you want? And you're gonna be able to make sure that it stays at 300. Okay, so moving on, um, next we're gonna look at what I think of as the two main uses of your cover. Um, as Chelsea was talking about, you know, we do judge books by their cover. Um, whether for good or for bad, that is a thing that happens. So when I think about covers, I tend to think that you've basically got two markets, essentially, that you can appeal to. You can create a cover for your readers, or you can create a cover for your genre. Um, and to kind of exemplify that a little bit, I've got two books here. Um, on the left, you're gonna see the nutrition code. This is a book that speaks very much to the readers. So it's using those bright yellows and oranges and maybe even a little bit of pinks in there with that sunflower imagery. Um, it's got that kind of stylized text that you, uh, Chelsea was talking about with the, the kind of, it looks a little handwritten um, for the word nutrition. And it also uses that unique font for nutrition to draw your eye to it. Um, it's very clear that this is a book about nutrition. Um, the subtitle lays that out for you in a very, very clear manner, again, using that emphasized text of heal and thrive. It's aiming to speak to people that are interested in, you know, taking control of their health, of, you know, losing weight or getting um, more in shape or I don't, I don't know a lot about these things, but <laughs> it's, there is a very specific reader that this kind of cover appeals to so that when you're in the bookstore, if you've gone to the bookstore and, or even if you didn't go looking for this kind of book, if you're just in the mindset of being healthier, of taking care of yourself, this cover should very quickly jump out at you. Um, on the other side of that coin, we have speaking to your genre. And so with uh, the book on the right, Secrets of the Bending Grove, we've got a book that doesn't necessarily target a specific reader, but it targets the genre. So this is a book that is about, um, you know, family struggles and um, there's, there's a little bit of mystery and some kind of some uh, adversity overcoming. And then there's, there's a little bit of a love story kind of layered in there as well. Um, so there's a lot going on with this book, but it's about, you know, struggle primarily. Um, and so you can kind of see that in this cover in that it is darker. It uses contrasting white and black with the, the red of the earrings to kind of draw your eyes. It's a slightly simpler cover than the nutrition code but that's because it's speaking to a slightly broader, less defined audience in that it is just targeting a genre. Um, so, you know, and it, it doesn't have that romance, you know, topless cowboy sort of thing going on that you see in some romance novels because it is targeting a sort of niche genre within, you know, the, the romance family struggle, um, overcoming adversity. So because it is so narrow and so specific, rather than looking for those readers who might not identify easily with any specific cover, it speaks to a genre. And I actually don't know how much intent this author had behind this cover there, but it's one of the ones that when I see it on the Lulu bookstore, it always stands out to me as being very definitive of the genre that they're trying to speak to. Oh, Paul, actually, one of the things that I want to understand in my slides, I think these two covers do a really good job, but when you're thinking about your book cover, just think of one element, I mean, you're trying to convey 
one theme or element of your book. So, um, you know, when you're thinking about the design elements, you have to be really intentional about those. But each of these books have, you know, the sunflower is very prominent. The outline of this woman is very prominent. And those are the, the that's the one thing that they're trying to convey. Um, so although we're going over a lot of different tips and techniques, it's important to remember that you really just want to pick one theme um, that you are trying to share through your cover. Um, and so these are really great examples of that. Absolutely. And that's very important. Um, and it ties back into what we're talking about here with knowing, you know, who you're targeting. So mm -hmm. if your intent is to target your readers, then thinking about how you can do that intentionally. Um, yeah, very true. Um, all right. And so the last piece of design um, is your color scheme. Well, the last, uh, the, sorry, not the last piece of your design. The next piece of your design that we're going to talk about is the color scheme. Um, and as Chelsea touched on, there are some trends towards yellows and oranges and pinks. Um, but what we've got on this slide is a uh, color scheme matching kind of chart from um, CoverDesignStudio.com. It's a great site if you want to get some inspiration and some ideas, and they do a lot of uh, great blog content about cover designing. Um, I love this chart because it really kind of lays out for you what I think all of us know intuitively when we go into a bookstore. Um, but it kind of it spells it out in such a nice way. I, I was just from the top here, we have red as a color that speaks to energy, enthusiasm, emotion, power. And you think about when you see a cover that uses red, those are always those feelings that you're going to have. Um, another one that I like, uh, black, is on the lower right side of the, um, the chart there. Thinking about Secrets of the Bending Grove and how black as, uh, asserts authority, power, control, and then mystery and suspense. I think that's one of the things that's really brilliant about that cover is it's not a story that fits perfectly into one defined genre. It kind of really drills down into the niche of a genre. And so the mystery and suspense coupled with that authority, black really is great. And it's a tricky color to use on your cover, but done well with that, that cover in particular. Um, so this is really important to know and to think about, and also to appreciate that these aren't set in stone. You know, um, using a color like pink, which is very popular right now, um, youthful playfulness emotion innocence it doesn't necessarily have to speak to that your story could be you know about a lack of innocence and you might use pink to get some attention on the cover in a way that draws a contrast as opposed to speaking to that tone so it isn't always important that you use these exactly as they're defined it's just important that you're aware of these kind of mental frames that your reader is going to have when they see your cover so that you can be thinking about it when you're creating the cover. Okay, and now I am on to the last piece of the design puzzle here that we want to talk about, and that's the typography. So this one's really tricky because you could just look at a hundred different fonts. There are so many. Um, the, the one that Chelsea mentioned earlier, Lydia, I actually don't even like all that much. I understand Aww. that it's really popular, but it's, I don't, it doesn't, doesn't do it for me. It's okay, Paul. Um, <laughs> so the cover that we're featuring here is a Scott Semigrand's Sammy and Budgie. Um, a couple of things I want to point out with this cover. First, you'll notice on the front cover, there's some differences in the title versus author. But if you look really closely, they're the same font. They're just used in a slightly different stylized manner to give some differentiation. And I think this is really well done because it creates a continuity um, while also creating a contrast. And then you'll also notice in very light white script, the A Novel By, just above his author name, also really brilliant because it kind of draws you into it. Um, next, if you look on his flaps and his back cover, Scott has included a lot of text on this cover. And granted, it's a dust jacket, so he's got some extra space to work with. But he's done it in a really intentional, careful way. He's used a clean, um, you know, con interior content type of font as opposed to a flashy cover font, um, which I think is really smart for the way he's done this because he wants you to read it. He doesn't want you to just glance at it and think of the, the typography as art. He wants you to read this. He's got something to say here. Um, he's gone through and justified it, which I think is great because I hate reading copy in a book that is, uh, you know, left justified. I really want it to be filling up that space. Um, he's done everything that Chelsea mentioned for, you know, a good cover design with the back cover blurb, the um, the testimonials. He's talking about himself a little bit, um, and then he's also got this really clean red on black for his spine, which I think is just really blows me away because it ties in with the color scheme that he's got. You know, he's got this very specific 
you know, kind of blue, gray, black, red scheme going on that you can see in the front cover. But the way that he's employed it on the spine means this book, if it were on a bookshelf, would stand out still, just with those colors, with that really clean, bold, all capped font. Um, so it's just a good example. And this is a tough one to pin down and tell you, you know, you should do your typography this way because there is no right answer. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those things that when you see it, you know when it works. And then we'll, and we'll look at some examples in just a moment of ones that don't work so well. And I think you'll be able to kind of see that contrast. Yeah, and don't forget your spine is also another place for you to to be creative and do that design. And yeah, I, I, yeah that's a great point. Scott does a wonderful job. But thinking on that bookshelf, mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's not cover facing, um, and 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 also to consider is that a lot of bookstores won't accept the book if they don't have that information on the spine um, because they can't really shelve it that way. Um, so yeah, it's just more real estate for you to kind of play around with. Yeah, and I mean, in the digital world, we tend to think of front covers. 90% of the time because it is so important that you have that front cover thumbnail, but more and more you can see your whole book cover online too. So the thumbnail, the front cover is going to grab people's attention while they're browsing. But once they've decided to look at your book, you know, if they're on Amazon or they're on, you know, if they're on your Shopify store that you've created with Lulu Express and there's my shameless plug, but <laughs> you know, you have the option to include multiple images. You could include a full spread like we've got right here. Um, you know, this isn't a terribly hard graphic to create. I'm told, I don't actually know anything about creating graphics, but you know, so think about your full cover as Chelsea was saying, that's really what's important there. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to look at for designing a cover is what I would call an incredibly effective front cover thumbnail. So we just talked a lot about designing a full cover, and you can't see it here, but this book does have a beautiful full cover. The art wraps all the way around to the back. Um, but just looking at this front cover, um, you can see how this book or this cover uh, teases out what this book is going to be about. Um, it uses really compelling, beautiful imagery. It's this watercolor graphic. We see the, the animal in the lower, these kind of weird creatures coming out of the trees in the upper area. It perfectly frames the title, which has used two colors to create a contrast. Um, I, the way that this author has made the, uh, the title stand out in this very busy cover is really brilliant. We see that the art and the title intersect just a little bit, as Chelsea was talking about, having the art overlap your copy. Um, the, the letter E in scene is being kind of stabbed through by whatever this creature is holding. Um, it uses a sort of typographical hierarchy, which is one of the things that um, Scott's book does really well too, with the kind of using the same font with different effects on the front cover. Um, this author, Sarah, is using colors to create that hierarchy. And so you can naturally, you don't actually read this top down. You read the, the title, her name, and then you kind of are drawn back to that subtitle, which is sort of hard to see. And at first, I didn't like that. I kind of thought maybe she should have had that subtitle in white so it stood out. But the more I look at it, the more sense it makes that you kind of have to zone in and really kind of get right in there with this book cover to, to read that. Um, she's done that very intentionally, and it, and it works really well. Um, and then, as we've talked about a whole bunch, it's just so intentional. Um, so that's really, I really like this cover for the intentionality of it, the cleanness. And it's just a really beautiful graphic paired with some very good, purposeful fonts. Um, okay, and then last thing we're going to look at here are some covers that I think don't work so well. So, no offense to any of these authors. Um, you know, you, you've created a book, you've got it out there, you're selling your book, you're doing your thing, and that's awesome. I would say all of these authors should take their books and reconsider their covers a little bit. Um, I'm going to pick out a couple of them, but I encourage everyone when you get this uh, slide deck in a couple days, when we send out the email with the slides and the video, take this slide in particular and stare at it and really look at these and think to yourself, what would you have done differently? Just knowing what you know about this cover, just the title and the graphic that you can see. And how can you let that inform what you're doing for your own cover? So I'm going to start with the uh, the lower left one, the wizard from Earth. So what's up with that? Is that a, a parachute in the upper right? I don't know what's going on there. Um, I guess thinking the wizard's from Earth and maybe he's parachuting back to Earth. I don't know. The trees look like something that were created in maybe Minecraft. They're so pixelated. The, the copy itself is way up in the upper left. So like, yes, it works in this thumbnail we're seeing, but it's very possible that it could get trimmed. You might lose some of the T and the. That wouldn't be very good. Um, 
Next one I want to look at is the one directly to its right, uh, follow your dreams. So there's a boat. So I'm hoping this person, this author's dream is to be either a pirate or a sailor or a boat builder or something. It doesn't mean anything. It, 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 in the exact opposite way that seen unseen tells you a story just with the graphic. You don't necessarily know what's going to happen in the book based on that, that graphic story, but this one is telling you a story that doesn't fit with the title. Then we've got the fact that this title literally uses three different fonts. I don't know what's going on with that. It looks like it's just consistency. I, I would want to see it be more consistent. Likewise, the way the author's name is styled, it's a really interesting styling on the angel. If they had left off their first name, it might have worked. I don't know. Um, and so I'm not going to keep going over these. I just want to throw these out there as examples to to really consider how you might be able to avoid some of these sorts of mistakes and um, think on how to make an effective cover. And someone actually had a good point here, a good question actually. Um, so Muhammad asked, what speaks more to the observer, the background or the title text? Mm, good Ooh, question. So that is, um, yeah, it's a great question. It's really tough to, to say, it can vary. So um, I'm gonna actually just go back one slide real quick here. So seen unseen, I feel the, the graphic speaks more and you're not as drawn to the text um, you kind of get into the text almost like it didn't need to be there. Like you could almost not have the text and you'd still be able to kind of get the story of this cover that's drawing you in. I'm gonna slide back one more. Sammy and Budgie definitely draws you to the text first um, because the graphic isn't as rich. Like it's still a great cover and I love the kind of the layers of color that they've done there with this outline, um, but you're really drawn to that title. So I would say, one, it's sort of personal opinion. What do you personally get drawn to in a cover? Um, two, there's a certain level of intent to your goal with the cover. You know, if you're, we saw with Omar Epps' book, he puts his name top foremost above the title because he's got a recognizable name. So he's using that to draw you in. Um, or if you're kind of an unknown and you're really needing to sell out your book based on the the graphic of it, then you do need to really balance what is going to be important. Do you want someone to read your title because you think that's going to be the best way to draw them in, or do you want them to be drawn to the graphic and kind of get that visual story that's going to inspire them to keep reading? All right, and so last thing I'm going to do before I hand it off to Lolly here to talk a little bit more about uh, marketing with your cover is I'm just going to quickly point out four tools that I think are great for designing your cover. Um, first, we have Canva. It's free, web-based, canva.com. Um, they are, it's very simple. They do have a paid service that gives you a little bit more access, and that's actually very affordable, too. You could always, you know, jump in and use it for a month and cancel your service once you're done building it. Um, it's very simple. It lets you do some basic cover designs. It's a great way to manipulate images that you then will put into your full, full cover. Um, so I really like that one. The other end of the spectrum, if you really want to go all out, is the Adobe Suite. Um, and that is going to be Illustrator, Photoshop, and InDesign. Those tools are the highest of the high-end graphic design. Adobe's been doing this for decades, and they know what they're doing. If you are a graphic designer, you're probably already familiar with them, and you're probably already designing in Photoshop. Um, if you're not, and you're getting into that, and you really want to do this professionally, they are the ones to think about. Um, Affinity is a software by Serif that is very similar to Adobe Suite. They are more cost effective. They're a, each piece of the um, software they offer is a one-time fee, much more affordable. So I find they can do almost everything Adobe software can do. And I find as a novice, which I am very, very much a novice, I am, you do not want to see the covers that I design. <laughs> um, I find Affinity software a little bit easier to use as someone that's not very good with it. Um, so Adobe, if you really know what you're doing, Affinity is pretty good if you want to just, if you're learning and you don't want to invest a lot. And then last up, GIMP is open source image editing, totally free to use. The trade-off there is that it is really hard to use. I have tried a couple of times to do some graphic design with GIMP and I failed horribly. Um, so anyone that can get in there and figure it out and learn how to use it, it's incredibly powerful and it's free, so that's great but you're going to have to plan on investing a fair amount of time in reading, watching videos, all of that to really get your head wrapped around it. All right, and now I'm going to pass 
everything over to Lolly, and she's going to talk about how to make your cover work for you. Thanks, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so today I'm just going to share a few tips on how to make your cover work for you. Uh, so if you have a professional looking cover, uh, one that's aesthetically pleasing and speaks exactly to your audience, um, one that stands out on the shelf and online, uh, basically all of the best practices we've mentioned so far, uh, marketing your book is going to be a lot easier. So before we dive in, um, I just wanted to share a few examples of some of our authors who are doing a really, really great job using social media to promote their book. Um, and also just really thinking outside the box with different ways to use their cover as a marketing tool. Um, and I'll go over some of those ways in a moment. Um, so go feel free to follow them to see how uh, they're making their cover work for them. So social media should be a key pillar to your author platform. Uh, love it or hate it, it's here to stay. Uh, so here are some ways that you can use social media to engage your fans, build brand awareness, and promote your book. If you're already doing these things well, uh, then you're totally crushing it. <laughs> uh, so get feedback from your fans. Social media makes it really easy and fun to ask your audience for feedback. Uh, so maybe you have one cover and then you'd like to know what your audience thinks. Uh, Instagram poll stickers um, or question stickers are a great way to do that. Um, or maybe you're deciding between two versions of your cover. So you can post two pictures side by side on Facebook or Twitter um, and ask your audience what they think. You can also ask for user-generated content. So social media is a really great place to show off your fans. Uh, so just ask your readers to take a picture with their copy of your book. Um, and you can even incentivize them by offering a chance to be featured on your social media channels um, or maybe um, offer them a chance to get a ticket to one of your upcoming author or speaking events or even a signed cop copy of another one of your books. Uh, a pro tip for this is to create a unique hashtag for your book and ask them to use it so that you can easily find and share their content on your page. Build credibility. So social media is a great place to show off your book reviews. Uh, just create an image that includes your book cover uh, and text from one of your top reviews. Um, as Chelsea said at the beginning, there's really nothing more convincing than um, a potential reader seeing one of your fans with your book or reading a top review. Um, and create shareable content. So designing your cover isn't just for the shelf anymore. It's also for thumbnails online, bookstagrams, and shelfies. Uh, and Instagram really is the place to do that. Um, and I know I've been talking about Instagram a lot, but this is really where the Bookstagram community is. Uh, so make sure that you're tagging them and getting them to share your posts as well. Uh, so I just wanted to share a couple of pro tips when taking photos. Uh, use natural light as much as you can. Uh, you also don't need to spend a lot of money on props or backdrops to get that perfect Bookstagram. Uh, contact paper actually works really great for backdrops. Um, and of course you can use what's in the house for props. Uh, we know you have a really cute coffee mug lying around somewhere, um, so that should do the trick. Um, and the last pro tip, uh, pick backgrounds that are the complementary colors of the main shade of your book cover and, and use that contrast to really make your book pop. So for example, if your book cover um, is orange, you could put it on a blue background for a really nice contrast. Um, and of course, a few other ways to create shareable content on social are through GIFs, boomerangs, or uh, time lapses. These are all really great ways to not just show off the cover of your book, um, but also the inside of your book too, to give your readers a sneak peek. So even though social media is an amazing tool, uh, you can also think outside the box and really get creative with your marketing. So I'm sure that you've seen people put their book cover on bookmarks to hand out at events. Another creative way to use your cover to promote your book is to print your cover out as a poster um, or a canvas print uh, for wall art. Um, so this is not only just a really beautiful way to show off your cover art, but you could also potentially uh, sign these prints and sell them as well. Last thing I wanted to mention was know when it's time to redesign. So um, the image here on the slide is from Lulu author and animator Don Dixon, and he actually illustrated multiple covers for his children's book before he decided to publish it. Um, and he actually posted this image as a carousel post on Instagram, and we really just loved seeing the transformation. So I wanted to include that here. Um, but here are two reasons why you may want to redesign your cover. 
Uh, so number one, uh, to attract new readers or boost sales for your book. Uh, so if you've already published your book and it's been selling consistently for a while, uh, you might want to freshen it up. So by this time, um, you most likely have already have a loyal fan base, so you can kind of afford to switch it up and attract new readers. Um, and, you know, see if the new cover is selling better, but, you know, you can always switch it back if not. Uh, a second reason why you might want to redesign is to increase sales for your backlist. Uh, so if it's been a significant amount of time and your target market or genre has slightly changed, uh, it might be time to refresh your cover. One creative way to do this is to create a bundle of some of your similar titles and update them, um, update all of the branding for all of the books in the bundle to kind of incorporate a, cons a consistent theme. Um, this is essentially how you'd brand your covers uh, for a series uh, like Chelsea mentioned earlier. Another creative way to do this is to diversify your products and convert a paperback uh, to a hardcover and vice versa. Um, so adding a new product is going to mean that you're going to have to update your files anyway, so you might as well give your book a new look and feel. And of course, with self-publishing, it makes it really easy to edit and revise your cover, uh, test out different ones, different prices, or different versions of your book to really see what works best for you. Um, and of course, you can always change it back if it's not quite working for you. Uh, so some key takeaways, I uh, just wanted to conclude with this. Uh, so your cover is a visual representation of your book. Remember that you want to blend in while standing out. Uh, so let your genre expectations help guide your design and make sure that you're really speaking to your audience and matching their expectations. Um, you also want to think about the niche within your genre and kind of think about how you can differentiate yourself uh, without moving too far away from it. You can meet the expectations of your readers by picking a color scheme for your book cover that fits the mood of your book. Um, but you can also make your cover stand out by using bold typography. Um, you also really want to choose one message, one idea, um, or theme to convey. So your message needs to really be clear, um, easy to understand, and easy to read. Uh, three important elements of cover design that you don't want to forget, uh, full bleed, spine width, and image quality. You really want to make sure you have high quality images, um, a minimum of 300 dpi. Um, and of course, use your cover as a marketing tool to build your audience ahead of launch, uh, and of course, after launch too. Uh, social media is going to be a really great tool to help you show off your book cover and boost your sales. Um, and don't forget to get creative with your marketing. Um, and last, just don't be afraid to revise your book cover to influence sales. Um, and last, we just want to provide you with a few resources from our blog and our Lulu University series on YouTube. Uh, both are really great resources for writing, editing, self-publishing, um, and book marketing tips. Um, so just want to share those with you as well. Um, before we finish up and head into our Q&A, we have a few minutes left. Um, I really quickly just wanted to mention that this webinar topic was actually based on feedback that we received from our previous webinar. Um, so please let us know what you'd like to see from us in the future. We, we really do want to hear from you. Um, so you can add your comments to the chat section of this webinar, um, or better yet, just email us at webinars at lulu.com. Uh, so now for some Q&A. Okay, cool deal. So we actually had a lot of good questions come in. Um, so. We're kind of, I'll just kind of start from the beginning and kind of get to the end and see if we can get some answers from everybody that really asks questions here. Um, so, Chelsea, um, when you were going, going over book covers, as far as book covers go, um, <clears throat> Tamika asked, what if we have a different series, uh, for instance, like a nonfiction, would each series have its own look or is it better to keep it more of like a uniform look? Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. So I would say if the series, um, are in different genres. So maybe if you write a romance series and then you do a series that's a thriller or, um, you know, even, well, it could be anything, poetry, whatever, um, then you may want to differentiate those just so you can kind of have, um, so your readers know exactly what they're getting from you based on the way that you styled each of those, um, each of those series. Um, but, you know, if they build on each other or if maybe the, the worlds that you're writing about intersect at all, then it can be kind of fun to sort of tease one on the other and sort of have some similarities between the two. Um, but I would just have to ask, um, you know, have you asked yourself, you know, if you were trying to set up two different kind of author um, imprints or, you know, a couple different authors have different author names that they'll write under. So is that something you're interested in? If you're doing that, then I would make them totally different. Um, if you're writing these under the same author name, 
and they're within the same genre, you may want to do them uh, and have them look a little bit more similar. Um, but it really sort of just depends on what you want the reader to get from those. So, um, you know, it's a long winded way to say it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> good answer, good answer. Um, Paul, um, Jody asks, um, you were explaining the spine calculation, um, the extremely hard math that we went through. <laughs> right. uh, does the calculation that you spoke about, does that only apply to white paper or is that more of a universal calculation? Uh, I'm so bad at math. Um, <laughs> so my understanding is that this uh, calculation is good for 60 pound paper, um, which is the standard. So you will get some variations in paper weight. Like Lulu offers 60, uh, 50, 60, and 80 pounds for our standard, and then up to 100 for some of our photo book options. Um, I know Amazon generally defaults to 50 pound. So there is variance in this. Um, we have this calculation from 60 pound, which is, I believe, the default for Ingram and um, Lulu's printing. And then because Amazon's is just slightly lighter, it will work for that as well. Um, the reason I, I reiterated during that presentation to double check with the value that your publisher, your print on demand company gives you when you go to upload the cover is because of that little bits of variation. Um, it's a great question because it is really tricky. It'd be nice if there was just this one completely universal spine width calculation. That calculation, my understanding works most of the time, nine times out of 10, but there are gonna be some variations where it might not work. Um, a good example would be if you have 80 pound paper, which is fairly heavy, and you've got a ton of pages, like a 400, 500 page book, that's gonna push that calculation right to the limits where it's probably gonna end up needing to be a slightly wider spine than the calculation gives you. Um, whereas if it was 80 pound paper and it was a 100 page book, you probably would be fine with that calculation because you're within that kind of that variance range. Um, so use that calculation for your paperback books. Um, white paper, cream paper, that shouldn't make a difference. Um, and then just verify, just make sure that you double check before you upload what the final calculation is. Your print on demand company should provide that for you. Awesome, and so speaking a little bit about format here, um, Elaine asked, my interior will contain haiku poetry. Should I left justify, the, should I left justify it in the presentation? Are you asking me? Yes. Um, <laughs> so that's a, that's a tricky one. I would say probably yes, you should. Um, I've also read books of poetry where it's center justified or, um, you know, something similar like that. So there's a lot of freedom in that part of it to decide how you want to design the actual layout. Um, Elaine, my suggestion would be go to your library and a bookstore and look for poetry books that do similar types of content, haikus and the like, and see how they relate out. You know, see if they did a center justification with some like graphic between the poems or if they were all just less justified um, to kind of control the space and then do what you think makes the most sense for your, your you know, your, your work. Uh, yeah, and, and one thing to keep in mind is that if you do choose to publish with a, a print-on-demand company, then, you know, you can try out as many variants as you want. I mean, and, and for most, not all, but most, um, have no minimums. Um, so if you just want to upload two projects, do one left justified, one center justified, or, you know, however you want to kind of move that around and just see how it looks when you get it back and, and which one you think is more compelling. Awesome. Um, and then I guess it's just a question for anybody who wants to answer it. If you redesign the cover, do you need a new ISBN? Um, it, not really. So the ISBN identifies the specific book and the, um, the metadata of it. So if you have a paperback book that is six by nine and you redesign the cover and in the process change the size to eight and a half by 11 or you change to a hard cover, then yes, you will need a new ISBN because the, the, the meat of the book has actually changed. Um, if you're just changing the graphics of it, in theory, you do not need a new ISBN. Um, and because ISBNs are expensive, I say that, you know, you don't have to make that change. If you're publishing on Lulu, we would not require you to make that change. But I would very strongly recommend that you list this new book as a new edition and you put a new ISBN on it because that will keep the old version cover and the new version cover separated as they're, they're the same contents, but they're different books. Um, it's totally up to the author, uh, but you know, best practice in my opinion would be that if you're making that substantial of a change, it's a new edition and you should get a new ISBN. Awesome.
Um, let's see. Don asks, uh, are there any best practices or tips for using stock art, do's or don'ts? Oh, um, well, I think that there are a lot of resources, and Paul touched on some that um, I think you did, that you can, where you can go and get stock art that is available. And, um, you know, and it's a great resource. And if you find something that you, you feel like really translates your theme or message or, you know, kind of going back to that one thing that you want to relay on your cover, if you find some stock art that does that, then, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, just like everything else, it can be well done and it can be poorly done. But if the image, um, if it speaks to you and you think it'll speak to your readers and you have the rights to it, those are kind of the big, the big three, I think. And uh, just to follow up on that, the rights part is really what's yeah. important. If you're on a site like Unsplash or Pixabay, or even Canva will sell you um, mm -hmm. art for like a dollar of an image or something, um, make sure when you go to use it that you get a piece of content that shows who owns it, who created it, so that you can credit them. Mm -hmm. If you, you're using something that shows that it's completely free and it's you know uncredited, that may be fine, but I wouldn't take a chance on it. It could be someone else's art and they don't even know that it's up there. So make sure you're using art that has a credit and then list that credit in your you know, copyright. Even if it's stock images, you know, even if it's something you got from like Adobe stock, list it in there as you know, images courtesy of Adobe stock for front and back. You'll see this on any professionally done cover. If you go to the bookstore, you'll see oftentimes on the back cover, they'll list you know, cover art by or something like that. So just give credit where credit's due. Awesome. Um, so we are kind of coming up to the end of the, the, the uh, webinar here. We do have time for, I think, one more question. So this one should be easy. Um, Paul, what was the website that you mentioned on color choices for covers? Um, bear with me one second. I'm going to pull out my notes here. Uh, CoverDesignStudio.com. And when, when I do a write-up with all of these uh, questions and answers in our blog in a couple of days, I'll list that link and put that link to the, the chart right there. Awesome. Yep. So like we said, um, you know, you did ask a question that we didn't get around to. We will, you know, include that in the email that we send back out. So have no fear. Um, we'll get your answers as soon as possible. Um, and I think that wraps things up for us, right? I think so. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we did get a lot of good feedback for good ideas for our next webinar, which thank is awesome. You. We appreciate that yeah. so much. And uh, again, thanks for tuning in. Have a good right. day. Take care.